welcome to Limitless. And today's guest is one of Britain's greatest ever female hockey players. Born and raised in the north of England, education and sport went hand in hand, graduating in 2003 with her BA Honours degree in sports science. But her list of achievements are legendary, with 375 appearances for her country, 19 medals, 49 goals, and 13 years as Great Britain and England hockey captain, and finally being awarded an OBE from Her Majesty the Queen in 2017. Today's guest is Kate Richardson Walsh. Welcome, Kate. Thanks very much for having me on. Pleasure. Kate, I'm really keen to uh, to hear about your early uh, career and why you went into hockey and kind of growing up in the north of England. Was that was that typical? And what drove you to that? Um, no, I mean, I had very sporty parents. So uh, mum and dad both played a variety of sports and we're both PE teachers so there's kind of no avoiding it really um and so we did a lot of gymnastics from a really young age um and then got into swimming quite heavily my, my sister and myself were heavy into swimming and we both didn't I don't think picked up a hockey stick my sister and I until we went to secondary schools we just went to our local state school and it was just in PE lessons you know you kind of did your as a, as a as a girl in those days bog standard hockey netball kind of round as athletics and I think the thing I loved most about it um, was that it was a team sport and having done lots of individual sports and learn and develop so much physically and mentally um, in those sports. I think just for the first time being part of something bigger um, and, and playing your role in that really appealed to me. So it kind of just started there, really. And, and, and awards and achievements came quite early on because you, you started to be recognised for your achievements in your teens. And, you know, was it the success of winning as well? Is, is that competitive streak in you? Um, yeah, I am competitive, definitely. And I think, yeah, I'm not sure. It was there, definitely there from a young age. And I don't know if that is that the kind of mental discipline that I learned as a swimmer, just the you know, push, being able to push yourself and, and doing it just for yourself. I think then in that team environment, I definitely had that plus the sense of responsibility for my teammates. And I think that's the, probably the thing that carried me throughout my career, that sense of responsibility to other people. It's part of something bigger. And, you know, when you go out there, all you can ever do is your best. I think that was instilled in me from my parents and my coaches. And, and again, that's something that I, again, tried to do in, in sport, but also in the rest of my life as well. So when you were embarking on your leadership journey, because you're, you're, you're talking two things there, you're talking about being part of a team, being a team player, but you're also talking about discipline and that courage of leading others, because uh, it is a very courageous thing to do, because you're the front and face of your team and you're representing your, your sector and your industry. What, what moved you into leadership and, and how, how confident did you feel when you first started leading the team? Yeah, not not very. I mean, I was a very shy um, teenager, uh, and, and even as a younger younger person, I was very shy. Um, I would never have wanted to speak in front of groups, and even up into my early twenties, I would still blush quite heavily when I was talking, even in a in a small group setting. I would, and, and then I would sense that, and I would become very anxious and nervous, and a little withdraw a little bit. Um, on the hockey pitch, I became a slightly different person. And I think that was what was so appealing and probably helped push me to into those leadership positions, particularly in the beginning. I I found my voice on the hockey pitch and I, I learned that I knew the game and that I was a student of the game and I was able to communicate tactics and information to players really clearly on the field. And and I think that gave me confidence and eventually instilled that confidence in me off the field as well. But it, it was definitely my leadership journey was was very much a journey. You know, I, I absolutely thought um, having been led in the way that I was led, I thought leadership was about, you know, I say you do. And it was very much one person command and control. And and over the years, just through lots of getting it wrong and lots of failure and lots of kind of soul searching and understanding what kind of leader I wanted to be established actually that leadership for me personally is about being the best version of me that I can be pushing myself setting those standards and then being able to ensure that everybody around me has that opportunity to be their very best version of themselves and help them do that in whatever way I can so more of that empowerment more of being of service um rather than that very autocratic style that I definitely grew up with and and knew very well um and and I think as, as i 
became more authentic and found what kind of leader I wanted to be. I felt like people followed me more readily and more easily and and I was happier and, and performing better myself as well. So it was a, it was a win-win in, in that aspect. You also demonstrated that you were talking about it is knowing your stuff. So you not only did you grow in your leadership style, but you were also building credibility through your successes as well. Then, of course, I mean, I'd love to take take, take your view on, um, you know, being an, an Olympic medal, gold medal winning Olympian. Um, that's a big step change from the core hockey that you were doing. Clearly, you and the, the uh, GB team were capable of doing that. But I remember you telling me once that you sat down one morning and thought, what would an Olympian eat for breakfast? And you changed your mindset. Now, you know, there's one thing you know, getting over imposter syndrome and there's one thing fundamentally changing your approach to everything you do. Talk us through that. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I played in the national team for 17 years and, and the first kind of 10 years, um, we could, we had kind of, we had, of course, we had team culture and we had mission statements and visions and goals and all of those lovely things, but they very often lived in a book um, lived on a page in a book and, and that's where they stayed and for the very first time because of the London Olympic Games we were able to have a full-time program and so we were in and around each other every day so of course training more but actually spending more time on our culture and fundamentally the difference for me when I see when we were consistently successful and when when we weren't so was was when we were actively understanding and putting into place what those visions and values meant day to day what were the behaviors and I think when we when we talked about those when we were explicit about those when we fully understood what was expected of each of us then we were able to challenge ourselves against that every day and exactly as you said in the lead up to London we had what we called our gold medal standards and just really simply just asking yourself and challenging yourself, would a gold medalist eat that breakfast this morning? And it just enabled you to have that, that check and challenge with yourself and then be able to check and challenge um, with your teammates in some boundaries that we have set for ourselves. And I think it's that creation of that framework, of that, that behavioural framework that really elevated us as a group because it meant that everybody could have a really valuable role and they knew what that was and they were able to deliver on that on a consistent basis so for me that's the absolute difference between high performing teams and teams that are just okay um i think it is that operationalizing those values into behaviors it's interesting hearing what you're saying there because there's great synergy to technology and whilst that isn't conscious you know an agile approach would be um, non-hierarchical, being collaborative, understanding behaviors, the unwritten rules, the supporting one another and the behaviours that are exhibited to how can we do our best? What is the right thing to do here? You know, that that approach over just processes and written down rules and procedures that are a guide, but living and breathing them uh, to get the best outcome is, is hugely aligned to, to, uh, to Agile. So I'm smiling there because I'm keen to also understand, you know, how much uh, technology and digital plays in sport, because, you know, you think of it very much as a physical activity, um, frequently disconnected from technology. And yet, you know, we've even seen in the pandemic people, you know, looking at their steps per day and their performance, et cetera, in order to be better versions of themselves when we come out of lockdown. Talk to me about how the impact of technology in sport. Goodness, I mean, it it, it really changed um, impact of technology. From if I look to the beginning of my career, kind of nineteen ninety nine, two thousand, when there was very little technology. Um, I remember we, we used to get sent a VHS tape in the post to analyze our game. That's how old I am. Um, you know, fast forward to you know twenty sixteen when it was completely really run and supported by the technology. So every single morning, without fail, we'd fill in an app. Um, on our phone to track our menstrual cycle, our mental health and well-being, our um, physical soreness, our heart rate, um, everything would be kind of input into a, an app and sent straight away to our strength and conditioning coach. We'd get, we'd do um, drop, drop jump testing in the gym, so force plates and force mats. We'd look at how much power we were um, exerting in the gym. We'd all wear GPS monitors um, in our training environment so they could track how far we'd run, how fast we'd run, how many turns we'd done in a session, how much force actually was going through our, our body. And then they were monitoring that live and they were collating all that data and being able to really make sure that we were training smarter 
and not necessarily harder, um, which was which was always good uh, for an athlete. But it is about, you know, you, you often think, oh, we must do more, we must do more. And actually it's about efficiency and using all that wonderful data that we can get from technology in a really powerful way. You know, even kind of how we did analysis on teams. I, I went to the Rio Olympic Games with iBooks on every team that we were going to play against. And it had video and data and edits and, and stats and all of that brilliant information on my phone, which, you know, we, we never, what I said, that VHS tape, fast track to that is, is everything. Even down to the kit that we wore, the technology, the fabric and the, and the sticks and the equipment, it absolutely was revolutionized by by technology and particularly i think in terms of our physical um capabilities through digital technology so when you went to rio you are the best version of yourself you're at your physical height of of greatness um i'm just gonna as, as i said at the beginning of this that the the medal achievements is significant but winning an olympic gold medal is different for an athlete tell us about that what, what why is it different the Olympics and the Paralympics, I think the same, are just, um, also for me anyway, I grew up watching the Olympic Games and every four years, you know, just getting that sense of, and I think it's even more so now, the whole country is just, for, you know, for two weeks of the Olympics and two weeks of the Paralympics, it's completely invested in in our athletes and we support them in sports we've never watched before and, you know, may never watch again for another four years, but we're completely with them. And I think... For, for particularly for sport, for Olympic sports and Paralympic sports, it's our it's our window, it's our opportunity, our platform to to showcase what our sport is about and to really um, be role models of our sport. So it, you kind of you have that little bit of external noise, I suppose, and external pressure. I mean, it's nothing that we can do anything about. It's actually just something to relish and enjoy and feel privileged um, and be very grateful for that opportunity to, to go and be part of that huge Olympic and Paralympic family. Um, and it's, you know, all these athletes from all around the world being at their very best, all living in one village together for two weeks, all trying to be their very best version of themselves. It's an electric, um, just exciting environment to be a part of. And particularly in Team GB, where we've had such success over the particularly last two Olympic Games, you want to play your part. You want to be a part of that success. And um, it's just a very supportive, high-performing you know, pressured and stressful, certainly, but a very special environment to be a part of. You've certainly created history and you carried the flag in the closing ceremony as well. So, you know, your your, your image is, is around the world and certainly your achievements are, are highly recognised. But also at a time, your private relationship, because your partner was also in the same team. So greatly you were able to celebrate that together. But because of your same gender relationship, you had a higher level of scrutiny, maybe for the wrong reasons and not just for your athleticism. How do you cope with that? Because that has to be an added pressure. Yeah, no, it, it was really interesting, actually, because, we, you know, Helen and I had, had been together since um, 2008. And um, it, it wasn't really new. Our relationship obviously wasn't really new to us. It wasn't new, certainly. It was just part of who we were um and when you go to something like the olympic games you don't you know the media just expands for a sport like hockey in particular you're now in front of global media and um you know normally you tend to get the you know how you think you're going to fare in this tournament you know what you think about your first game and you know all those kind of questions about performance and actually Helen and I found as we went down the kind of row of journalists we were only really facing questions about our relationship and kind of a few a few journalists down, we, we kind of had a little think and said, okay, you know, we can either kind of bridge and move away and move back to performance and just not answer these questions, or actually we can just be ourselves and answer the question really honestly, knowing that countries around the world and you know, frankly, even in in, in the UK. People are facing discrimination, violence, harassment because of their sexuality every day. And actually, it's really important that we use this opportunity to just be ourselves and to answer the questions in a really honest way. And, and in doing so, will help hopefully somebody feel a little bit more like themselves, that like they can be their selves. Like it's, it is normal. Of course, it is. And it's usualizing um, LGBTQ plus relationships. And we do feel really fortunate and lucky that we we're able to share such a wonderful moment 
lots of downs as well along the way, but that wonderful moment, particularly in Rio together. Um, and that was a, a really special time. And I think being part of that team and that bubble, and particularly in women's hockey, where I think being lesbian or gay or bisexual, I think is is open and is accepted and is talked about and it's just part and parcel of of life. I think it's it's very much feels normal. I think outside of that bubble, when we when we stepped outside of that bubble, we realised that is is not the same uh, in all parts of society. And that I think has been has been challenging. We've been very fortunate that we've received very little negative um feedback and press but um it, it hurts we, we we've gotten it and we still get it and it hurts um and I think the more you know talking about tech you know the more social media giants the, the more those people can uh really use the power that they have to shut down hate speech and I think freedom of speech is exactly what those social media platforms are for and that's brilliant I think for me there's a line and it's a very clear line between freedom of speech and hate speech and I think we need to make sure we are really stamping that down You've shared um, previously in, in different interviews, and we've had the pleasure of, of having you as a guest on, on Limitless um, in our private event forum, that it was those experiences that enabled you and your confidence and your um, comfort in yourself that you've been able to be an ambassador for the LGBT community. And we'll talk openly. You've got over your shyness of talking, but we'll do now be uh, recognised as a um, as someone who gives speeches and, and I guess gives confidence to those people who perhaps are less confident in the environments that you describe. But you shared, and I, I'm aware that you were heading to an event on one occasion, dressed in civilian clothes and not in sports clothes, and you were being chauffeur driven to this event, and you were having a just an informal conversation with the taxi driver, and you were dealing with prejudice and judgment uh, immediately in that vehicle. You know, doors closed on a motorway. That must have been intimidating. Talk us through that experience. Yeah, it was, you know, filled with irony. I was going to um, to speak at an LGBTQ plus uh, network event at a law firm in London and um, I was sat in the back and, you know, really chatty driver and we were just talking and he said, um, kind of got to the, understood that I was part of the Rio squad and we won the gold medal and he said, oh, what about that captain? Uh, and I was like, oh no. Thinking, well, I already know he's talking about me. I don't know what's going to come next. And he said, "What about that captain? She's, you know, she's getting it on with one of her teammates. That's not really right, is it?" And I just had that horrible kind of tension and anxiety, just that that sense that you get right in here in the centre of you. And and in that moment, I had a very split second, and I and I had that kind of fight or flight response. And I felt like, well, I'm in this car, I'm on, as you said, on the motorway. I need to get to this place. I don't know this person. I don't know where this conversation is going to go. And so I took a very quick decision to just kind of laugh it off and move the conversation on really quickly. And and I went to this network event and I actually told this story at the start of what I was going to talk about because I actually, for that moment on, really kicked myself. And, and from that point on, I've tried to when I felt safe to, and when I felt able to, to challenge, um, challenge that prejudice and challenge that discrimination when you, when I, when I've seen it or heard it, I felt it for myself, but also when I see it and hear it and feel it for other people, whether it's talking about racism or ableism or ageism or, you know, whatever it might be, transphobia, just really trying to, um, to give a voice to those people, to those marginalised people, to those people who are, have faced oppression and discrimination on a daily basis. And to do it in a way that's not confrontational, that's just to say, look, that makes me feel uncomfortable when you say that because, or have you thought about how that might feel for this person? Um, and just try and start the conversation that way. And sometimes it's not the time or the place to do that. Sometimes it is about just looking after your own safety and well-being. Um, but I think if all of us have can use our voice in that way, can be open to conversation, can be open to challenging discrimination when we hear it, then I think that's how, for me, we build a better society. That's how, for me, we, we actually start really working together and leveraging on our wonderful difference that we, that we have in this country is phenomenal it is absolutely our beauty, but unless we are willing to, to challenge discrimination, it, we're never going to really kind of breach that status quo that we currently have at the moment. 
So we're, we're holding this interview in March 2021 and International Women's Day was just this week. Um, the theme of this year's uh, International Women's Day, and it shouldn't just be one day, it should be every day of the year, is choose to challenge. So, you know, it, the, the ask is that when anybody sees uh, prejudice, injustice, etc., that we challenge it. Your guidance is always be safe in doing so and use your platform, your voice to support and protect others, um, which, you know, it... it it seems easy. It's a little bit like the the the, the rules of how to, to conduct versus living and breathing the values is it's everyone's responsibility to do that. I think that's what you're sharing with us. Now, you've obviously retired from hockey now and looking at you, you seem too young to be retired, but you're, you haven't stopped working. You're, you've now taken your sports uh, success and you've moved into business in the boardroom and, and continue a career as uh, as keynote speaking, et cetera. Um, how is that transition into business and what's the parallel between sports and achievement in business? Yeah, it's, it's been it's been really interesting. I, I, probably most of my work was either doing um, a kind of workshops with businesses and and looking at that comparison, but just coming in for a, maybe a keynote or a workshop for a day, and then and then leaving again. And the thing that I was really missing was being inside a team and, and, and making a difference from within and being there day to day with people. Um, and so an opportunity came up at, at Virgin Media, and I'd done a, a few things with them before. And I, and I jumped at it. So I'm working part time with them as a, as a leadership and high performance coach and, and specifically to do exactly as you said, to, to blend those worlds, to use my experience from a sporting uh, environment and background to, to, and to see how and where it can be used in that business setting. As my, as my boss says to me, I'm not a corporate slave yet. Um, so I'm able to have that completely different perspective and, and in some ways a naivety, I suppose, to ask some very, um, very honest and open questions because I come from a position of not not knowing. So, and that sometimes that's nice to just break up again that that status quo and, and how things done been done always that way and and why and asking some of those questions. So, I'm I'm really loving um, being within within a team again. It's a very fast paced, high energy uh, a business and um, with lots of really motivated and competitive people. So I feel like I'm I've joined my own. Um, and yeah, it's it's thinking about how we can, in such a vast company, still really focus on everybody having value and worth and getting the best out of every single person in this huge kind of juggernaut, uh, because it matters. It really matters. It has an impact on customers. It has an impact on service and it has an impact on the bottom line and just fundamentally our enjoyment of being at work. And so it's it's real. It's a really interesting time for me. I'm learning lots. Kate, your career journey has been epic and, you know, we've touched on just a small proportion of it today. So thank you for taking us through that journey. But if you were to reflect back, um, what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Such a good question. Um, I think my teenagers were like probably like most lots of people's teenagers. You know, I, I really wanted to be somebody else. I thought um, looking like somebody else, sounding like somebody else, you know, even thinking like somebody else was was what I needed to do and, and spent a lot of time and energy focused on that. And so I would say to my 18 year old self, who are you? Who do you want to be? What are your values? Where do you want to go? How do you want to be remembered? What do you what impact do you want to have on the people around you, on society? And I think just I wouldn't obviously know the answers probably at age 18, but at least opening up the possibility of answering some of those questions, to be curious about some of those questions and and to start on that journey of self-realization and understanding of who I am. I think that would have that would have, you know, I really started doing that in my kind of late 20s, early 30s. And I think I couldn't swear could I have been had I started that journey earlier. So just being comfortable with with who I am, the strengths that I have and what I can bring. Um, I think that's exactly what I would have told my 18 year old self. Okay, that's great advice. And thank you so much for sharing your journey with us today. Thanks so much for having me on. Good luck with everything, everybody.